Hi, my name's Scott. I'm a radiographer student here with Pima Medical Institute in Las Vegas, Nevada. So today I'm gonna to be going over the X-ray circuit, its associated components, and how they function. I'll also be going over the envelope, its associated components, and how they function. So let's go ahead and get started. So to very, very start off today, I wanna to talk about our electricity. So the electric electricity coming to our building is gonna be 60 Hertz at 220 volts. It'll hit a transformer and come inside our building and inside our building, it's going to run at 110 volts. So that's where we're, we're working with with our electricity. To start off though, I wanna go ahead and talk about our first thing we would do, and that would be hit our main switch. Our main switch is gonna turn on the machine and it's gonna start a procedure called the warm-up procedure. So our warm-up procedure is pretty important because it's gonna get the machine warm. It's parts that need to be warm, like our filament and our anode. It's gonna warm them up to be running at its efficient, uh, most efficient you know, peak performance. Um, so those are two things, turns the machines on, gets the warm procedure started, and that's what our main switch will be doing for us. Before we jump into it though, I wanna talk about our technique. Our technique that I'm gonna be using today will be our 70 kVp, our 80 ma, our 0 0.1 seconds, which in turn will be eight mass. Okay, so let's put that into our control panel, uh, you know, for our x-ray, and then we'll start talking about what, the, what will start happening. So we're gonna start off talking about our auto transformer or where our first induction will be. So we input the 70 kVp, our machine reads that, and it'll actually allow the auto transformer to set itself to the appropriate coil that represents 70 kVp. Uh, and it'll be induced from there and read by our kilovolt meter. Uh, in the same aspect, we're gonna be down here at our second induction, and this is going to be our variable risk resistor or our MA selector. <clears throat> it's going to read our 80 MA, it's going to set itself and it's gonna be read by the filament uh, ammeter, and it's going to continue on around up through here. We're gonna have our third induction right back at the auto transformer with this line being induced back in. Um, now, something I wanna preference is, I went one step at a time, and it was pretty slow, obviously, but in this process of starting it up, setting the technique, and having everything run, because it's uh, you know, electrical current, it's gonna happen really fast. These three lines that I just talked about here are going to be happening pretty much all at the same time very, very quickly. So just know that, but in this demonstration, obviously we can't <laughs> see that. Um, so now that we have our technique set, we're gonna go up here to our exposure switch and our timer. Our timer here is going to read our 0 0.1 seconds and it's gonna allow the machine to function uh, at, for that time but we do have to hit our exposure switch. Our exposure switch is kind of like a bridge. When it goes down, it allows the flow. When it's done, it comes up and will stop the flow. Or not stop the flow, but it will not permit the flow of current to happen. Um, so I do wanna hold up here and talk about something that's really important because if we do not hold the switch for the whole time, um, we're gonna have some errors happen and possibly potentially uh, lessen the life of our machine. Uh, so if we do not hold that exposure strip for the whole time that our technique will set, and we don't wait for the visual and uh, audio uh, cues to finish, we potentially can wear our machine a little bit faster. So just heads up on that, hold the switch, let the machine function properly, and then go from there. So now that we've talked about our primary circuit and our low voltage, let's switch over to our next part because that's going to be our fourth induction and getting things onto our high voltage. So let's go from there. So like I said, the power from the wall is coming at 110 volts. That's where our fourth induction is going to happen here up at our step up transformer. It's going to take that 110 volts and step it up to 10,000 volts. This is the 10,000 volts is what we're going to need to function our machine properly. Uh, now that it's stepped up, we do have one thing on this side that's very, very important, and it's gonna be our uh, MA meter. 
this is going to double check uh, two major things. It's going to check our MA and our S, so our mass, and it's going to double check that we have the appropriate power. So when it comes to that, if it's not enough, if it's under 10,000 volts, our machine will not function and it'll stop. If it is on the flip side and it is more than 10,000 volts, you know, let's just say for this instance, 15,000, it is going to catch that. That is an error. That is a failure. That's bad. Uh, and instead of allowing our machine to have a catastrophic failure, it's going to catch it and ground it. That's what the symbol here is. It's the ground symbol. It's going to catch the extra power. It's going to ground all of it and it's going to stop our machine because there was a problem. So now that our meter is run, let's say in this instance, though, we get our 10,000 volts. Our 10,000 volts are going to be stored in the capacitor normally in this uh, photo. That's not here, but I wanted to add it for the visuals. Um, it's going to store it in the capacitor and it's going to allow it be released through a falling load generator. Our following load generator can be associated to a dripping faucet. It's going to allow it to drip um, 10,000 volts at a time, <clears throat> just like you'd see a, a dripping faucet dripping water, but it is a constant 10,000 volts uh, for, the electric, uh, for the electrical circuit of the x-ray. Um, now that we have our following load generator, we're going to head over to our rectifier. So our rectifiers themselves is going to switch it from 10,000 volts alternating current to pulsating direct current or AC to pulsating DC. Also with our rectifiers here, we have our diodes. Our diodes are gonna allow the current to flow in certain directions. Let's go to that next slide so that we can see those visually. Okay, so I have our pink for one way and our orange for another. I'm just gonna show the direction just so that you visually see it. Our orange is gonna be this, uh, flow of current here. It's going to be down, go through a diode here, through the envelope, back around, again through the diode, allowing it to flow in this certain direction, and back. Our pink is going to be our other way. It's going to be up, over, through the diode, back around through the envelope, through the diode, and back here. Now that our anode side has kind of been talked about, we understand how we went from one side to the other, got our 110 volts to our 10,000 pulsating DC. Let's go back to our last induction that I want to talk about on this page. And that's going to be our step down, the, trans, uh, the filament transformer, and which will be our fifth induction and our last one talked about on this page. <clears throat> so it's going to take our 110 volts alternating current and it's going to step it down. So more coils to less. It's going to step it down to five to 15 volts. It also have three to five amps but this also will be alternating current. And again, this is our step down. So now that we're kind of talked all about the, the circuit side, let's jump over to our uh, envelope. Okay, so this is our envelope. Before we move too far, and I just wanna talk about a few parts, kind of what they are. So on our um, anode side, we have our 10,000 10, volts pulsating DC coming in, and it's going to be you know, electrifying our magnets, our stators. In turn, it'll rotate our uh, armature or our rotor. We have our bearings, which are going to spin our tungsten um, anode. So our tungsten, the reason I want to point out the tungsten anode because of the high heat. Tungsten can take a lot of heat. It's 3,370 uh, degrees Celsius. Uh, and once we talk a little bit more what this side does i'll explain why that's really nice um, but on this side we have our our associated wiring for our filament we have our nickel focusing cup and our uh, thoriated tungsten of a filament again thoriated tungsten high heat nickel it'll be used because uh this low negative potential it helps focus that uh electron beam, but again, I'll go a little bit more into that. Now that we've gone over the parts, let's again go over the function of this side. Like I said, the 10,000 volts will electrify the magnets, spin this. This uh, anode is going to be spinning from 3,600 to 10,000 volts. Uh, sorry, volts. I meant RPM. It's going to be spinning it, rotations per minute. Um, 
and the rotations plus that high heat that I was talking about, the 3,370, together work together to really keep that uh, the heat down and functioning efficiently. Um, now I do want to talk about before we move on, there are two failures on this side that we see a lot. Um, they're not super important to know. I just think this is more interesting. Um, you have your magnet failure or your stator failure. With that, you're going to see melting. So normal use of an anode, you're going to see what's called pitting. Uh, over use of time, the electrons hitting it, it'll pit the surface, but that's over years and years and years of use. Where it's a failure of the magnets is if it's not spinning at the correct RPM or not spinning at all, you'll get melting and it'll be a lot larger, it'll be a lot quicker. So that's one failure you can see. Another one is you're gonna be your bearing failure. Your bearing failure is gonna get, when you get a warped bearing, you could hear a sound, you could uh, it be a wobble, but what it eff effectively doing is lowering the efficiency. Again, it's not gonna allow the stator and the machine to uh, operate properly. So again, not super important, but really fun to know, good information, just kind of cool. <clears throat> Let's jump over to our other side. So our cathode side, we talked about the wiring, the focusing cup, and the filament. So there's a few things that I do want to talk about here. Like I said, you have your filament, the electrons are released from this area, which is called thermionic emission. When those uh, emissions are traveling from one side to the other. They travel in a thermionic cloud. The thermionic cloud will then hit its target area, and that's when ionization hits, goes out, and we have an X-ray photon. But to get there, we do need to understand a few different things. So, like I said, we have a low, uh, low potential negative charge that helps focus it, we have our grid bias tube, which goes from negative to positive and to help saturation current. Uh, and the saturation current is when the uh, appropriate amount of electrons have left. And so all those together are what's creating the thermionic emissions and the thermionic cloud helping it travel from one side to another. Um, now, something that we do have to understand is the target angle is going to be at a certain angle called, um, oh, it's not called, sorry. It's going to be our 12 degree angle. Um, all the electrons leaving here are going to travel from one side to the other. <clears throat> um, and they will be traveling quite accurately. Now, some will be held back, but that's called space charge effect. Not all electrons will leave the filament. And over time, that can be an issue. But for this instance, um, the thermionic emissions created uh, between all the functions we talked about, the grid bias tube, um, saturation current happening, they flow from one side to the other, and it's called the actual uh, focal spot, because the actual focal spot is going to be the movement from one side to the other, and actually the target it's hitting. When it hit and bounces down and out, the effective focal spot is going to be what's uh, hitting our target, what's what we're x-raying, and it's going to be the effective um, electrons being used or our x-ray photons. <clears throat> now the one thing I do want to explain, kind of like how not all electrons leave the filament, not all electrons will leave the tube. And this is going to be called our anode heel effect. Our anode heel effect, it's going to hit, it's not going to all leave, some will stay in, and this could uh, end up with tube arcing in the future after so much time, electrons stay in, they settle on the surfaces, and that could be another failure in the future uh, called tube arcing. Uh, from there, you have your 12 degree, it shoots out. Once it hits, the ionization happens, it spits out the X-ray photon, and that's how everything is created. So after this demonstration, hopefully you understand more about our X-ray circuit, more about our envelope, the associated parts, how they function and how they work, and how we end up with our x-ray photon. Thank you so much for watching and have a good day.